Hi everyone, welcome to today's meetup. I'm Camilla Kersner, co-host of today's event organized by the GDG Cloud Budapest community. As a group of Google Cloud enthusiasts, we strive to share valuable knowledge and new solutions on GCP with you. So I recommend everyone to join the community. You will see a presentation with demos in the first hour, which ends in an approximately 10 minutes long Q&A session. And then comes the workshop. You can use the chat on the right to ask your questions during the whole event. Let me introduce my co-host today, Zsigmond Pitot, who is also an organizer of the group. And with that, I give the word to you, Lauren. Thank you. Hello, everyone. This session will be first a presentation, as Camilla said, and a workshop. So we will maybe spend two hours together, and I hope you will learn a lot. I have a lot to show, so many examples. So as Camilla said, feel free to ask any question in the chat. Let's get rolling. So quick presentation. So my name is Laurent. As you could guess, uh, I'm French. You could guess from my accent. I'm working with Google Cloud. It's been six years now, over six years. And I'm a developer advocate. So it means at Google, I represent developers. And for the developers also, I speak about technology. I write articles and so on. My focus is on uh, applied AI, on serverless, and on the Python uh, language. And before that, I did something completely different. I co-founded a company. I was a pioneer of the in-book industry. I worked 17 years in this industry. And before that, uh, after being a student, I worked on a educational uh, solutions on CD-ROMs. Maybe some of you have never seen what a CD-ROM is. <laughs> At the time, the internet was very slow. So if you wanted to have a mobile application, actually you bought a CD-ROM. Okay. So I love to start a presentation with this quote when I speak about AI, about machine learning because it still looks like magic. Anytime something new is made with machine learning, it really looks like magic, but this is not magic, it's just technology. And so my goal is to show you that, you know, it's technology, but maybe to help you understand how it works. And also maybe to give you ideas, to incentivize you, to push you to use AI in your own solutions and to build something smarter. It's really easy. Uh, I forgot to tell you, I'm not an expert in AI. That's weird, but I've been using AI as a developer, as a user for years. I've been following that for 20 years. I could see the evolution. And so my goal is to give you ideas and hopefully you will do something with it. Okay. So what is machine learning? To start with my own definition, this is how I've been using machine learning. You have data, whatever the type of data you have. And from this data, you're able to extract information to understand what your data is about. And so if you understand what your data is about, then most probably you're able to do something smart or smarter with it, okay? Of course, it's not the real definition. The definition of machine learning, it's actually a part of AI. It's dealing with algorithms and within machine learning, you have deep learning, which is dealing with neural networks. And then most recently, so it's the big hype right now, but it's just the beginning. In one year, it would be something else. We all speak about generative AI, gen AI. So we'll see examples. Okay. And so what is deep learning? So you get most of the progresses for the last, let's say five years, you got all these improvements, all the magic that you could see comes from deep learning, even though it started over 40 years ago. So deep learning is trying to mimic the way our brain works or the way we think it works. For that, we need examples. And it's very similar to the way we learn. If you think about it, when we are kids, we learn from examples. Our parents tell us, no, you should not do that. Yes, you can do that. Our teachers show us examples. Our brothers and sisters show us what to do, what not to do. So that's a big way of how we learn. And the magic there is thanks to that, we manage to improve, we manage to solve problems. And as developers, we really managed to solve problems now that we couldn't solve before. I'll show you examples. Maybe the only issue is that we don't really always understand how it works. It's still a little bit like a black box, but it just keeps improving almost every day. Every week you hear about something new. And once again, it's just the beginning. It For the next decades, it will uh, keep improving. So. If we take a step back and if we try 
to see how we can benefit from machine learning. And of course, there's the legacy way. You can become an expert. If you have enough time or if your main focus is machine learning, you can absolutely develop expertise. I am 50 years old. If I was in my 20s, I would spend 100% of my time or almost doing machine learning. It's a passionate field, but it's so big, you cannot be an expert in everything in machine learning. You already have to pick something and focus on something. And so if you focus on machine learning, then you will have to deal with neural networks mainly or algorithms if it's just machine learning, not deep learning. Then a few years back, companies like Google were able to propose pre-trained models. So models that are ready to use. And so we call them the machine learning APIs because they are just like an API. You send a request and you get an answer. Okay. And let's say about four years ago, a new technique appeared that we call auto ML. So I think the term caught on and you can find it from different companies now. With auto ML, you can actually derive one of these existing models and build your own, still without any expertise. And more recently, so less than one year ago, everybody is now speaking about LLM, large language models. And with these models, with a prompt, you can generate something. And it's even a bit larger than that. You will see in the workshop, we'll try some examples. And so the goal of the first part is to show you examples of this because you can really build something with this and you can see them as building blocks. That's how we call them. It's really like a Lego brick. You take the brick, you put it into your software architecture and you can do something smart with it. So let's start to see examples of what you can do with uh, existing machine learning models. So if you remember my definition, you have data and from this data, you extract information. So the data can be almost anything today, it can be text, images, videos, and speech. So here you have the Google Cloud products because I have access to that, I can use everything. Uh, but keep in mind, I will show you example is the principles are pretty much generic. So maybe you will see something similar with another cloud provider or with a specialized company, okay? And so those are the products I've been using, but the principles are there. You have text, images, videos, or speech. And from that, you can extract information. And sometimes the information that you want to extract is actually your input in a different form. Something really, really new that just keeps <laughs> changing every week right now is Gen AI. So Gen AI is a new part of this. So you will find pre-trained models. And with Gen AI, as of today, but it's going to change. Uh, one month ago, it was smaller than that. So it's going at a very fast pace. You can use text, you can use images, you can use speech. And with LLM, LVM and so on, regenerative AI and more, you can solve lots of new problems. With prompt, you can generate text, you can generate code, you can analyze images a lot better than you could do before by asking questions with a prompt and so on. And also you can generate and edit images. So that's something very exciting as well, because it can help you. If you're a graphist, then you have a new AI assistant that can save you a lot of time. And finally, something very, very new is that you can generate your own search engine, your own chatbot, your own recommendation engine based on your own data. And you can actually uh, query, you can have a chat, you can ask questions. And so this is what you know about chat GPT and so on, but on your own data, enterprise data. Maybe you heard yesterday, Bard is now also able to do something similar with your own content. So you ask a question about your own content and then for instance, it will read, if you allow it, it will read your own emails and try to synthesize something, uh, answer your question with it. So it's a big, big field. I will uh, show you as many examples as possible of the ready to use models, the ML APIs, and we will do the Gen AI part in the workshop. Okay, you will be able to try it yourself. So let's start with a vision model. What can a vision model do? So this is my favorite field. So it's really personal because as a student, so in the 90s, it's a problem I was trying to solve with my teachers. And at the time to understand what we had in a picture, the only way we had was trying to uh, find edges in a picture and from the edges, maybe find flowers here. 
it kind of worked, but it was super frustrating because as soon as we would use a new picture, very often it didn't work anymore. And machine learning is able to go beyond that. Machine learning is able to keep, to extract the principles, extract the features, the characteristics of your problem, and can give right answers on content that it has never seen before. And so what can a vision model do? Historically, so first vision models could describe you pictures with labels. So in this picture, I know that it's about nature, flower, garden, and so on. Okay. I told you it's an API. So here, for instance, if you send a REST request, this is the JSON answer that you get. You know, uh, it's about nature. You have a confidence score. So you know that it's super confident that this is about nature. Okay. You can be more precise than that. You can detect objects with their bounding boxes. So for instance, here, this is the cast of uh, the Lord of the Rings movies. They are in a restaurant. And so here, the vision model tells me that they are persons. I have the big bounding boxes here. I know the location of the pants, so it's more precise, or the tops here. The small person in the background is detected as well here, and even the ceiling lamp. So it's super easy to use, and you can uh, get something more precise than that. Likewise, for faces, you can detect faces, even though they are not really human. So here's a 3D rendition of Gollum. And so I know that there's a face. I know the two bounding boxes, large one, close up one for the face. I know the position of the eyes, the nose, the mouth, and everything. And even the vision model tries to tell me which sentiments are detected. And what I have here is that Likely, this face is angry, and this is Gollum. Gollum is always angry. And you get a lot more features. Another field that has been fully, fully solved, it's almost perfect, thanks to machine learning, it's OCR, text detection, optical character recognition. It's almost perfect. You can trust it, solve problem without any doubt. And so what you get is a screenshot. If you give this screenshot to the vision model, what you have is, of course, the text. And here, the text is perfect. And you also have the structure or the raw structure of the text. So I, here in green, I have three blocks. Then I have the different lines, the different words, the different symbols. So I can exactly know the text that has been found here. But keep in mind, I'm saying here it's almost perfect. So you can really trust it. But all machine learning models make mistakes. They cannot be 100% precise or accurate. So keep in mind that and also try to see the limits of your problem, of your use case. And so I'm tr always trying to see when it works and when it doesn't work. And so here it's easy. I'm trying to distort my screenshot. I'm applying here a perspective effect and it still works. It's still the same one. Perfect. Even kind of boring. So it really, it's a solve problem. But there's something a lot more difficult. It's handwriting detection because each of us has a different handwriting. Here is a sheet of paper with Tolkien's handwriting. And the vision model is able to give me everything. It's a lot harder. So it's not as perfect as super good as for printed text. But here I have everything. And I'm trying to see if there's a mistake. The double quotes here are lost. But that's it. But what I can share with you is that I've been uh, trying this example for a couple of years. And last year, it was making a very annoying mistake. It will uh, tell me three rings for the even kings. And I know that even kings doesn't mean anything. So it would miss the L here in Elven. So I would autocorrect, of course. It's not even kings, it's Elven kings. But what's nice is that models improve over time. So they keep being trained on new examples. And so they improve and I could see the mistakes it was doing. It was doing another one before, just disappeared after some time. So that's also a super nice feature of machine learning models. Usually when you train them with more examples or better examples, they improve and mistakes can disappear. And maybe one of the last features for a vision model is that you can detect famous entities. So we call them web entities because famous persons or objects, you can find them on the web. And so here to try that, I took a picture of Tolkien that I had never seen before. It's coming from a Spanish newspaper. And so I tried it, I cropped it, I zoomed in, applied the color filter, 
to make sure that the model has never seen it before. And what it's able to do is that it tells me that this feature likely is about GRR Tolkien, which is perfect. So it's not telling me Tolkien is here. Maybe now it could, but it's just telling me this feature is about GRR Tolkien because there's a partial matching image on the web here. And that's actually the picture that I used and modified. And that way I was amazed because it's a super nice way to find similarities or to do image matching with anything, someone or something famous. A super cool feature as a developer is that here I have an entity ID. So I have a unique identifier for Tolkien, the father. And depending on the context, it could be Christopher Tolkien, the son, who kept writing new books or kept the legacy of his father. And so as a developer, I don't have to deal with text. Of course, I can display this, but I can use this unique identifier to precisely identify a Tolkien, the father, in a picture or you'll see in something else. And here at the end, it's doing image matching. And so you have lists of pictures that are similar. So a man or a woman against a tree or people in a forest and so on and so on. It's used by some companies to try to detect copyright infringement, for instance. So I told you it's an API, so you can do a REST request. You can do an RPC, a low level request, if you need to be as fast as possible. But we do provide, and you can find client libraries. I guess you'll find one of your favorite languages here. And that's just the code you need to call the model. So it's always the same principle. You create a client. So the client is the wrapper around the API. You provide the content. So here it's an image. And then you call the feature, the method that you want. Here is, for instance, face detection. And in this case, it's almost real time. In one second, you have the result. And here, right away, you can display or print the bounding boxes of the faces that have been detected. And also here, for instance, the sentiments. So is the face surprise or and so on and so on. So we'll do a live demo together a bit later, but keep in mind that you can do a lot on pictures. And likewise, you can extrapolate, you can do something similar on videos. Maybe it's easier, I'm gonna show you a demo. So here, this is a video that has been analyzed with the video intelligence model. And from that, we got a very long JSON response with all everything that could be detected. So you see the video is four minutes long. So it's like a picture, but with one more dimension, time. So maybe the first thing that is obvious is that the video model is able to detect the different sequences. And you see there are lots of them. They're pretty short, four seconds, two seconds, three, 10 seconds. So you can go directly to a sequence, but within each sequence, you can also know in the video what has been found. So for instance, there are road streets here two times. There's a bridge. And so if I go at the beginning of the video, indeed, there's a bridge here. You can do object detection. So here, if I have a look at the object tracking part, it's telling me there's a bridge here, but as it's able to detect the sequences in the video, it's also able to track the different objects. And so here, for instance, this is bridge one. If there were several bridges, it would detect them. And if I keep playing the video, you will see the bridge is being tracked inside the sequence. You see, it's moving. And likewise for the other objects. So it also works on persons. So you can get the bounding boxes, but also the skeleton. You see the arms, the legs, and so on. It works at the face level as well. Uh, you can detect uh, the faces. So like in a picture, but they are being tracked, right? Because you know how they are. the model is able to see how the different frames are moving. And so you can really track the different faces inside the video. It can detect logos. So here, what do we have? There's a YouTube logo here. Yeah, there's a small YouTube logo here. Logos that are detected are famous logos. So here you can see Panasonic, Berkeley, Nike. And what else? You can do speech transcription. So the speech that's in the video, you know, the four minutes, you can transform it into text. But you'll see it's a machine learning model on its own. You can do text detection exactly like you've seen before in OCR, there's a lot of text. So what do we have? Uh, North Shore here. 
there's a lot of text here. It's a Google map. So you see all the text that has been detected. And likewise, it's it's tracked. Here it can be tracked. And one of the last features is you can also try to detect whether the video is safe or not. And this video is very safe everywhere. There's just this one potentially uh, explicit content here. But I guess it's because this woman here has naked arms. So you see, it's not very likely, just one likely detection here. So you see, you can do a lot on videos. And of course, it's not real time here. You have other ways to do it in real time. Here, you provide the video, you launch uh, the processing. And after a few dozen seconds, because it's doing it in parallel, you get the results. And then you can do something like that, track anything you'd like. So we've seen what you can do on pictures and on videos. This is a tutorial that I wrote. So this is just the code you need. And I'll give you a link at the end uh, with all everything I've done, the articles. And so in one article, I have actually uh, automatically generated uh, GIF animations like this one for all the important objects detected in a video. So here is an extraction of a video. It's a GIF and everything was fully automated. So everything visual, pictures, videos, but of course, researchers started to work on text first. And so this is called NLP, natural language processing. And this is an NL, natural language model. So what can you do? The first thing you can do is, if you provide it with text, is analyze the syntax of the text that you provide. So first of all, it tells me that this is English. So you don't need machine learning to do that. You can do a statistical analysis. But for the syntax, you really need machine learning at this level of precision. So here I get everything on this text, gender, the type of every item, I would say a word, but it's more like a token because for instance, a punctuation sign is not a word per se. And depending on the language, you get all the specifics. As a developer, one thing that is super nice is that you can get the lemmas. A lemma is the canonical form. So for instance, for was, I get B the verb to be. Uh, for plurals, I get the singular and so on. And so that's a nice way to get this, the canonical form and work in an easier way with words or tokens. The second one is entity detection. Like you saw on pictures, you can do that on text. And so on the same text, what I get are three different classes here in red, persons. Tolkien is a person, a writer is a person, a poet is a person. And this is the kind of uh, response that I get. So I get Tolkien, a person, I get a Wikipedia URL, so linking me to the, the page of Tolkien. But here I get a unique ID and it's exactly the same as before in the picture or if it was a video likewise. So once again, it's super nice because I can just keep using this ID and I will uniquely identify the entity in text, pictures and videos. British here is mapped to the UK as a location. And each book at the end, The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, The Silmarillion, each of them is detected as a work of art with a link to the web entity. Everything is perfect. It's working super nicely. And it can help you know at a more precise level what you have inside a big corpus of text. Likewise, you can do content classification. So on this text, it tells me it should be classified under books and literature at 97% of confidence, and that is perfect. This type of feature is used by newspapers, for instance. Some of them are very old. They've been here for over one century sometimes. And so what they've done uh, most of the time is that they have scanned their archives. They have done an OCR pass, so they have the text of all their articles. And now either you do a search to find something, or also you can browse the articles and they can be automatically classified with this feature. Another feature that is very similar to what you saw on picture is sentiment analysis. And so it helps you detect whether the text is positive, neutral, or negative. And so to try it, I use two uh, reviews of The Hobbit, a positive one from the New York Times and a negative one uh, on a social network. And what I get, so for instance, at the sentence level, I get a score between minus one and plus one. And here the negative sentences actually do come from the negative review. The positive ones come from the New York Times. 
And I'm not showing here, but many neutral sentences between minus 0.3 and plus 0.3 because most of the time we are rather neutral and we speak in a nuanced way. Maybe you don't see the point, but it's super useful to analyze reviews, to analyze emails. For instance, it helps you know whether your customers are happy, but you can go into the details because very often you can propose a rating like one to five stars, but it's an average sentiment for your customers. If they say, oh, I give you three, uh, maybe you are very good at something and very bad at something else. You have no idea. And so with the sentiment analysis, companies can go into the details and they know that, for instance, in the restaurant, the food was marvelous, so super positive, but the service was terrible. And so maybe they should hire new people to have a better service. So it helps companies go into the details. And a new feature that's pretty recent, actually uh, writing an article about it, I already published it. You can do text moderation. And on the text, you can know from 16 categories how toxic, how sensitive the content is. So I took exactly the same review as before. In the review, Pauline said, I hate the book, something yeah, getting on my nerves and so on. But this is not a toxic review. It's an objective review. And as you can see, it's telling that maybe it's toxic, but only on 24%. There are maybe insults, but only at 18%. So this text is pretty safe. And companies can use that now to moderate, to do online moderations in chats or whenever people put reviews or whatever, whenever your customers or your users write uh, something. Okay, it can, so there are 16 categories. It can help you detect something that you'd like to avoid. And so still, this is very easy to use. It's almost real time. You provide the text, you call analyze sentiment, text moderate, moderate text and so on. And you have the results right away that you can use in your solution. Another machine learning model that you have all used without knowing is the translation model. It's Google Translate. So you've used it on the web. You know how it works. Maybe it's been useful to you, I guess, uh, in some cases. Uh, what I can share with you is that seven years ago, I was not working with Google. I had my own company and I was using Google Translate before that even. It was okay. I was translating Chinese and Japanese texts that I don't read and don't speak into English or into French. It was okay. It helped me understand what was in the text, but you could tell it was a machine translation. And seven years ago, something happened. Suddenly, it was a lot better. So all the better for me. I kept using it even more and with more comfort. But what happened at the time is that the Google Translate team switched to a machine learning model. And you can see in green the improvements. So of course, a professional translator is still better, more precise, but the qualitative jump was super high. It's like a logarithmic scale here. And I could feel that English to French or it was a Japanese and a Chinese to English for me or French. And it was a big green bar like this. I could feel the difference. And now even for ourselves, our Google Cloud documentations are translated from English to many different languages automatically for, I would say, two to three years now. And I've been asked to review some translations and they are super good. It's hard to tell that it's a machine translation. Yeah. Um, if you have questions about it, we can go. You just need two lines to call it. You create a client and you call translate and that's it. You have the translation. It works on text and HTML. Now two, two other machine learning models that are ready to use speech to text and text to speech. You have used them somehow uh, on your mobile phone, maybe at home with a, if you have an assistant, maybe on your TV, on your remote control. This is the first step to have an assistant. You first speak to it. Your speech is transcribed into text. And then the text is analyzed with the model that we saw before, the natural language model. So what's super nice is that it works in real time. The results are super good and it's robust to noise. So think about it. All the machine learning models that you see are trained on real life examples, on actual examples. They need that to learn. And on speech, you have noise. Uh, usually if you do a recording, unless you are in a studio, you will have noise, my kids, the cars in the street and so on. And so when you have noise in your data and if the training is successful, your model 
is robust to noise. And this is why it works so well. It's super nice. You have lots of new features, additional features like uh, asking for punctuation, which is pretty hard to get the timestamp location. If you have multiple speakers, you can try to get speaker one, speaker two. So it's starting to work pretty well. And so keep in mind, if you understand what your data is about, you will always be able to index it. And so it means, for instance, you can have a search engine. If your company has lots of speech data, you can index it and you can know exactly where each word has been pronounced. So it means you can go straight to the word in your speech, it's your speech file. So this is another tutorial that I wrote. I recorded myself reciting French poetry. So let me tell you. Maître Corbeau sur un arbre perché tenait en son bec un fromage. It's a very famous French poem. I want you to try. So this is what I did, just these few lines, and the result is super good. So I'm missing, I would like maybe here, uh, to have a comma or something, but it's super hard. It's a poem. Uh, so poetry, there's a specific prosody, you know, the rhythm in the poetry. So honestly, it's working super nice. Of course, in standard speech, it works a lot better. You get the commas, the dots, and so on. So that's one of the limits. When you do something out of the bounds or something super specific, then it works, but maybe not as well as you like. Here, it works super nicely. The opposite now, text-to-speech, again, it's a machine learning model. You provide it with text and it's able to generate a synthetic voice. So this one has been made by DeepMind. I have to admit it's the most advanced machine learning model because it's really amazing when you hear the voice, or maybe we'll try that in the workshop. When you hear the voice, you cannot tell whether it's a human being or a machine. It, it's better than real time. In one second, you can generate 20 seconds of speech. There are articles about it if you'd like to know more, but maybe it's best that I try doing something with it. So I'm pretty sure you know, but maybe you didn't notice. You can do a vocal search in Google. So I'm gonna do a vocal search, but in a specific way. So I didn't rehearse my Hungarian, so I will only speak English or French. But I'm going to try something. So I'll do as if I was a tourist in New York with my French accent, OK? So in the past, when I tried that with a speech to text engine, it never worked unless you spoke perfectly British, American, and we'll see the result. So let's activate my microphone. So I'm going to do as if I was a French tourist in New York or in London, OK? What is the temperature in London? So you don't get the answer, but I heard a perfect voice here with the temperature in London, but you heard my voice. And I don't know if you could see, but in real time, it would give me a word, not always the right word at the beginning, but it would correct it. And so this is exactly what I pronounced. And you can try that. You can try to speak English with a Hungarian accent. I try to speak French with a British accent and it does work. So it means that it's like noise. An accent is like noise. So you can see it's really robust to noise. So it means that the model has really learned to understand speech. So it's super useful. It works super well. You can find automated subtitle on YouTube, for instance. So again, you can find mistakes, but most of the time it will give you the right answer and uh, live, which is pretty amazing. So if you'd like to try that with code, this is uh, typically what you can do with just these few lines. You indicate parameters if you'd like to have stereo, mono, uh, the quality of the output that you want, but you just give it the text. You choose one of the hundreds of voices that are available and that you have the audio file immediately. We'll try that in the workshop if you're interested. And again, Gen AI is super new. So Rather than showing you examples, we will see examples all together at the same time, me on my screen and you on your own laptops in the workshop, so in the second part. So you've seen what you can do with existing machine learning models, but sometimes it will not be enough, especially for your business use cases, maybe. So let me give you this example. So here I have two pictures, okay? They are different, they are similar, but they are different. And if I give them to the vision model, I get pretty much the same results. Because in a generic way, those are clouds in the sky. 
but if I'd like to do a weather forecasting application and be able to detect that I have a Cyrus here and an alto cumulus here, then I'm stuck. The model didn't learn to detect these types of clouds. But as a developer, thanks to AutoML techniques, I can solve this problem. And so this is the principle of AutoML. So this time you build your own custom machine learning model. But for that, you need training data. So you need pictures, you need videos, you need text, and so on. And it's always the same principles. You create a training set, a data set. That's the work you need to provide. You fetch the examples for the training of your model. Everything else is automated. You launch a training and then you have a model that you can use. And the model has been customized, is smarter and knows how to predict or to detect your own examples, okay? I won't go into the details. Maybe you will ask about it. There are different ways, but you can generate your own models, different sorts of models, different use cases. So here, those are the pictures. You don't need thousands of, usually a machine learning model learns on, on millions or billions of examples. Here, you just need ideally 100 examples per uh, cloud type here. So I said ideally 1000, but it starts to work with 100. Here I have about two to 300 pictures of each. So you provide the data. Here you just need to label each picture with the type of cloud that you see. That's it. Once you have your data set, by experience, it's an iterative process. So first I did here a quick training just to understand how it's doing. So I gave a budget of one compute hour. After like 20 minutes, I got an answer and I knew that the model was 84% precise. But I could see the mistakes here quickly after less than an hour. And so I saw that I had mistakes in my data set. So for instance, some pictures had the wrong label. So I fixed that and launched a second training here, a longer one, three compute hours. And my model went from 84 to 90% of accuracy. And then I can keep improving with better examples and so on. One of the tools in this type of problems that you can use is the confusion matrix. So here I can see that my model is super good 96% on the cumulonimbus to detect four types of clouds, but not on this one. The alto cumulus is pretty bad. It's like random, right? It's close to 50%. So it means I have an issue in my data set. So if I go back to my data set, so first I have less pictures of the alto cumulus, but that's not the main issue. The main issue is that dozens of pictures were extracted from a video. And so like I have 20 pictures of an alto cumulus taken from a plane, but it's actually the same cloud every time, just moving a little bit. It does not add any value. So it means actually I have a lot less pictures of the alto cumulus because of this mistake that I made in my data. And so it's super easy to fix. I just need to remove them and provide new examples. And so once the training is done, the first one, second one, whatever, you keep all the different versions, you can use your model. You can deploy it and use it live, or you can also use it when you need overnight in batch mode. It's up to you, it depends on your use case. And so here I deployed my model. I uploaded a picture coming from my smartphone. The picture is not in the data set. I took it in Poland a few years back and it's telling me at 97% of confidence that it's a cumulus and that's perfect. Of course, you can make mistakes. You'll see that soon. So AutoML techniques are available in Google Cloud with the Vertex AI platform. So it's a big AI platform and you can solve all those problems today. You can do image classification. That's what we do when we want to detect different types of clouds. For instance, you can detect different labels in the same picture. You can detect objects so you can be more precise than that. You can do image segmentation. So for instance, you can detect that this pixel belongs to the blue object, the pyramid, that this pixel belongs to the cube and that this pixel belongs to the background, for instance. Likewise, in videos, you can detect actions. You can track custom objects that you'd like to track and that the video intelligence model is not able to track. You can classify videos and so on. Likewise, on text, you can build your own text classification models. You can detect your own entities in text. You can detect your own sentiments. You can do your own custom translations and something 
that is more machine learning than deep learning is that you can do your own regressions, classifications, and forecasting on data. So if you have tables, databases, CSV files, Excel files, so if you have rows and columns, you can say, you can, this is your training data, you can say, okay, here are all my columns. This is the column that I'd like to predict. And automatically it will use this column as the prediction goal and will build an automated model for you and you'll be able to, to do predictions. It's amazing because it's fully automated and I've been doing that with experts. And when I did that, AutoML was better than the experts in the row. I did that with 60 experts in a workshop. So it's demo time for all of us. So we're going to try in a live demo, the vision API. So the vision model to detect sentiments, generic sentiments, but I've done my own custom auto ML model. Not very useful, but fun to detect people with the tongue out, people yawning or people sleeping. This is the architecture. So just one reminder, the session is recorded. Okay. So I'm going to refresh the screen. So this is using another camera on my laptop here. So try to did to trigger a generic emotion like. So here it's able to tell me, okay, I'm surprised. As I know the location of the nose, the mouse, and the orientation of the eyes, I try to put a mustache to everyone here. Let's try another one. So you see my camera is a very bad quality but it does work here i'm happy we'll see the results a bit later now let's switch to my own auto ml model and if you refresh the page or go next now you can try to trigger one of these three sentiments so let's try okay i'm sleeping so you see it works in real time it's super fast and here i detected that i'm sleeping if you'd like to improve my model just for this demo you can uh, check that and let's try another one, uh, the tongue out. Okay, so you see the lightning uh, is very specific, but it's able to detect that I have my tongue out. But you could say that I'm cheating because of course I did the training data myself. And so I used selfies of myself. So now surprise, let's see if it works for you. So first with generic emotions, happy persons, yes. Everyone is happy, more or less. Surprise people, two of us, yeah. Nobody tried or managed to trigger sadness and angriness. It's harder to detect. And people with the tongue out, yes, the three of us. People yawning, yeah. So no mistake here, you see. True positives, true positives. People sleeping, perfect. Okay, so here, I don't know what you tried. You know what you tried to do. Here, your eyes are almost closed. So I think it's what it detected. But as humans, we know that you do not sleep with a big smile. <laughs> so I know you're not sleeping. So typically here, we could say it's a false positive. And so typically I would use such a picture to improve my model, to say, okay, this person is not sleeping. This person is doing something else. This person is, uh, doesn't have the tongue out, is not yawning, but is not sleeping. The, the eyes are like that, but with a big smile, no. So I don't care. I'm not spotting anything. I would just say, okay, this is something else. This is not sleeping. And then it will learn after a new training. So this is how I kept improving my model. I just did four trainings so far. And of course you can do object detection. So you can know here, all of us with glasses and it does work every time. You see? Hey, more people sleeping. Okay, you tried. Yawning. Okay. So you see, it's super easy. And here is what I did. This is the code that is in the cloud. This is what is called in Python. So just when a selfie is uploaded, it calls these features face detection, object localization for the glasses, face stir detection if something, someone violent would be in the picture. And I have the results right away. And here in a stash club welcome, I just add a mustache to everyone. It's super easy. I did this prototype in one afternoon. I will show you these examples. I've been able to build a custom model that I would have loved to have in my previous life. So here, this is one of the ebook readers or electronic board that I built in my own company before. 
and I would have loved to do quality inspection at the factory. And so here, with just 100 pictures, I said, okay, here are the objects that I'd like to detect in my pictures. And I was able to do an edge model, so a smaller model that I can export. And what you see here is actually a web page. And with the webcam running and so on, I can do four to five predictions per second. On dedicated hardware, I could do 10, 20 more. And it's working super nicely. And that's the first training that I did on. So keep in mind that I'm just showing as many examples as possible, but it's just a small portion. There are lots of more things that you can do. You can, of course, become an expert. You can work on documents where you have something specific. You, you can analyze invoices, receipts, tables, forms. You can do automated detections. I've written articles on that. I'll give you the links. You can build your own chatbot. And if you're a big company, then you can also have your own call center. With document AI, here is an example. So this is my handwriting, uh, no, my wife and kids handwritings. And the OCR is perfect. It's able to detect everything, including the different handwritings, but also it's able here to detect it's a form that here it's a, a key of value. So I can actually do automated detection on that. Another example, you can automatically detect identity documents. So here it's a, an online demo. I'll give you the link. I did that in a couple of days. It's production quality and super nice. Okay, so it's time to wrap up the presentation. What have we seen? You can focus on expertise, you can focus on development, and you don't need much time to use an existing machine learning model, just a couple of hours. You can do a prototype in hours. Uh, likewise with LLM, with AutoML, you need one or two days at least. And the difficulty with existing models, there's absolutely no difficulty. Just use it right away. With LLM, you need some prompt know-how. You need to try a few prompts before it starts to work for your own needs. For AutoML, you need a good data set. Lots of links, articles that I've written, a comic book if you'd like to know more about machine learning. If you'd like to, to be informed and benefit from lots of stuff, you can join the Google Cloud Innovators Program. At once, so questions now. The first question was the pricing of AutoML. For AutoML, you pay for training. So I don't remember the prices, but what I can share with you is this. So the model to detect components here, I paid $35 for that, a few hours of training. I would like to improve it a little bit, but I can use it right away. The quality is already pretty good. I paid $35. It means if I had a company, Without any machine learning expert, I am still able to, to build something that works. So $35 was the training. Then you pay when you use the model, if you deploy it. But here, this is a model that I exported. And so I only paid $35 for the training and that, that's it. The next question is, you have mentioned generated models for AutoML. Can you explain in more details how this could be used? So when you have your training data, you launch a training and you decide about your needs. So if your priority is precision, if you'd like to have the best results possible, then you need to select a cloud training. It will generate the largest machine learning model, and then you will need to use it in the cloud. But this is how you can get the best results. If you'd like to export the model and use it in a mobile application, in a web page, what else, in a dedicated device on the Raspberry Pi, for instance, or on another computer in a container, so it works for images and videos, then you can do an edge model like I did, and you can export it. And so the training is a bit more expensive, but then after that, you don't pay anything because you use the model where you'd like to use it. What confidence can we give to the ML results? Is it reliable enough for prediction? What can we do when it doesn't work? So yes, you can be confident in the results, but you need to be cautious always, <laughs> even today. It will never be perfect. So maybe in a few decades, I don't know if something brand new is invented, but a machine learning model can always make mistakes. And especially when it's confronted to something really new that is, it has not been trained on. And so you have to keep that in mind. It makes mistakes. And so it should not today make decisions instead of a human. This is an assistant. It should help you. It should help your company. It should help a solution. It should help your application. Okay. So 
you need to be conscious about it and to improve. If it's a model that you don't control, then wait for the company to make new trainings and improve it. And it occurs pretty frequently. But if it's an auto ML model, then improve it. Provide new examples, provide counter examples, improve your data set. Some, maybe you made a mistake. If you made a mistake in your training set, then it's a pity because uh, it didn't learn as well as it should have. So this is my experience with that. And of course, you'll find plenty of literature on the web. Do you know any well-known example that use AutoML in production? Yeah, but there are examples I cannot share. What I can tell you, for instance, I know a company in the UK who has dash cams in their trucks and they record all the time what's happening. And whenever something happens in the car, they try to analyze and they have built their own video models for that. Like they try to detect accidents. They try to detect in another country when the trucks go back into the parking lot, they try to detect scratches outside and so on. Self-driving cars might use something similar, yes, but it's done by researchers, so they have access to everything and they try to go deeper and understand everything, control everything. So researchers, they can use AutoML, they can do that as to evaluate a prototype, but very often as they are experts, they try to build something more specific and they can get better results when they know exactly what they're doing. But AutoML is just amazing. I've tried it a few times with experts and it's always funny to see that it's doing better than experts. Keep in mind, AutoML lets you have super good results very quickly, faster than humans. And so maybe experts will have better results, but it will take them more time. Let me give you one example. I've seen a contest on Kaggle. So it's a platform for machine learning experts worldwide. And sometimes there are contests. So there's a prize and the team in the world that is able to give the best results wins the prize. And one time it has been $1 million. So it can be a big contest. And so what I've seen on one of the contests is that AutoML, so it was not really competing, but testing the data set and giving results as a machine, as an AutoML test. After two days, it was number one in the contest. And it took two weeks for worldwide experts to beat the first AutoML model. So AutoML lets you get very good results quickly, depending on your examples, on pretty much lots of different examples. If you are an expert, you know what you're doing, maybe you will manage to do better. But two days and two weeks, <laughs> it's a big difference. And the worldwide teams were working all together to try to improve their work giving hints, oh, I managed to do better and so on. It's a pretty nice example. I love it. And I could witness it internally. I'm going to give you the link to everything here. So you could scan the QR code. You will find everything you've seen and also online demos, articles I've written and a bit more. So thank you. It's workshop time. So in the workshop, what we are going to do, I'm going to do it with you from scratch. So whether you're new to Google Cloud or not, I will give you a link to get one credit, okay? So I am in incognito mode. This is a brand new account. Okay, you should be presented with this. So you log in with one Google account, it can be a Gmail account or any other email that has been attached to a Google account. So this is one limitation, it has to be a Google account. So this is the first time, so I'm selecting my new Gmail account. I'm going slowly so that you can be with me. Keep in mind for this stage, you need to allow third party cookies. So in Chrome, this is here and I sign in again. Okay. So now I should be signed in. Okay. And so if you click here, you can redeem one credit. Okay. So I click here to access your credits. And so it opens a Google Cloud. So use it with the account that you'd like to use for the workshop. So I'm going to use this account. I am in France, but doesn't matter. It should be automated. I just have to select to agree to the terms of service. Don't check email updates. You will receive news later. Otherwise, you are on Google Cloud. If it's the first time, you need to agree on the terms of service and continue. And then you are on the credit page. You just need to accept the credit. Okay. 
And so now I am in the Google Cloud Console. And what it's doing is it's adding the credit to a billing account. And it has also created my first project. So in Google Cloud, everything you do, your work unit is a project. So here I just have one project so far. It's my first project, so I have no choice. But you can create several projects here. For instance, I'm working on data science, I'm working on a mobile application, I'm working on a website, then I can have a different project for everything. So make sure you have one project selected. So what's specific to this workshop is that you don't need a credit card to do it. The credit that I gave you, that you get, lets you go through. Later, if you'd like to go on, and once you've consumed the credit, you can create a new billing account. But keep in mind that you can also benefit from $300 of credit. So don't do that today because you will need a credit card as a security measure. So you can dismiss that, but keep in mind that when you have used the current credit, then you can still keep using your account, okay? So you can see here that I have my first project created. So now you are in Google Cloud. And this is in the presentation, but I will give you the link. So we're going to start with Gen AI. So this is something I've not shown you so far. What's interesting in Gen AI Studio is that you can see the different families of problems that you can solve. Under the language part, so this is LLM, large language models. So this is, if you know better, ChatGPT or, or BARD. This is the core model of such tools. You can see here the different problems that you can solve. They are classified in different families. So first, you can use LLM to build a chatbot. For instance, let's say we'd like to do a customer service chatbot. So you can open this and you have an example. You can start with this. can be intimidated, but okay. So I'm going to close the left part to have more space. And so here, you can give the context to the LLM model. You are a customer service representative. You represent this company. Here is our policy. How many days do I have to return my purchase? And you provide the answer. So this is the context of your customer service, for instance. You can give it more examples, like I was in a car accident. So you can get examples from actual exchanges with customers here. And then you can use the LLM model let me show you the code. So it's always prompt based, exactly like you would uh, chit chat with Bard. It's text based all the time. And so this is the context that you can see. These are the examples. And then you can just send the different chat messages. And then you will just keep adding new messages every time the user is asking. So here, this is like a chat. I can try something crazy like I disagree. I'm pissed off. I can even try to be rude so to your manager. So of course I wouldn't do that, but I'm trying to see the limit of the model. Okay, I need to enable, maybe you got that. This is the first time I'm using this API. So on a per project basis, I need to enable it. It's a security measure. In your company, maybe an admin would let you use this and this, but not something else. So here just one time, I need to do it for this project once, and then I can go on. It's going to always be the same principle, but now I can use everything in Vertex AI. So let me enter the text again. Okay. And I have the answer. So you see, this is real time. I understand that you are not satisfied with our return policy. I would be happy to transfer you to a manager who can assist you further. Please hold while I connect you. So here, of course, <laughs> the LLM model is not going to connect me, but here you will need to take this into account and maybe try to detect and then go to a different pipeline. But here the answer is pretty nice. This is typically what a real human would do. You just need to, <laughs> to, to go on, of course. But you can try anything, you will see the results. So here, this is customer chatbot service. You can do a lot more than that, but you can see how easy it is to do it. Here, I did one example and one exchange, and that's it. And you can provide additional examples. You can think about any crazy conversation in a chatbot. Okay.
So first, a family of problems that you can solve. Think about exchanges with a customer service or a chatbot or an automated email answer, for instance. Of course, be transparent. You have to be clear with your users that this is a machine answer. Okay, so let's go to the second. This one is easier, summarization. So you can have any type of content and you can get the summarization. So you see here, it's a news article. I don't have the time to read it. I can, with this prompt, provide a brief summary for the following article. This is the code, so you see. It's always the same code, except here you need to provide the content of the article. And let's see the result. So it takes two seconds. Daniel Radcliffe replaced Harry Potter turning 80. Okay, so you see I get a summary in two sentences, and this is exactly a brief summary. So this is one of the features that are the most used right now because it works super well. The content is in what you provide. It's able to summarize it. Internally at Google, we've been using that <laughs> without knowing for, I would say, one year now in chat. So in chat, you know, we have, I have teammates in Australia, I have teammates in California, in Japan, anywhere. So when we start working at the beginning of the day, very usually we have lots of answers coming from all over the world. And sometimes there are lots of exchanges. And so typically in Google chat, at the beginning of a thread, we have a summary of, oh, your teammate Tom said this. And so, and you have a nice summarization and it is super helpful because you know whether you'd like to uh, dig in or whether you can skip with a quick summary. So big time saver and super easy to use. If you try it, feel free to add messages in the chat. If you find something funny or if it works, if it doesn't work, it's always interesting to have feedback. So you can summarize pretty much anything and you'll see if you try the structured way, you can be more specific depending on your use case. You can do classification. What can we find? Classify articles. Okay, let's see that. So the prompt is the following. You want to classify text in entertainment, technology, politics. So this is the context. So this is the beginning of your prompt. And then you provide the text. So here you can see text and so on. Okay, there's a lot of text here. So you see, this is the prompt. Let's check the code. The beginning of the prompt is always going to be the same here. But here, typically, this is the text that you would input depending on the article. So let's launch the query, submit. One, two. Okay, so it took two seconds and it classified it uh, in culture. So it's taking the closest. I didn't try it so far, this one. So let me quickly see whether, yeah, traditional samba. So yeah, typically, this is a cultural article about Brazil and samba. So you see, it's, <laughs> what's super nice with Gen AI is that you can solve problems that you've seen before, maybe with dedicated machine learning models. But here, just based on text, it's able to maybe solve problems that you don't even need AutoML for. Because culture is not a classification for the natural language API, for instance. How do you get one word as a response? Okay, so this is typically something that you would indicate in the prompt. So let me open it again in the classification. So here in the prompt, what is the topic of this text? So you say entertainment, technology, politics, and so on. So you guide in your prompt, you try to be more specific. For instance, in the previous example for a summary, if you don't want a too long summary, so it was just brief summary, but you could say, please provide me with a summary in one sentence. Okay, so try to be more specific. And so typically here you need to play with the prompt, try and see what works and also what works consistently. And so this is why we speak about prompt engineering. You need to develop some experience with the different prompts that you can type. I hope it answers your question, Madina. Feel free to ask again if it was not clear. Let's see another problem. This one is interesting, extraction. Let's take this one, tech specs. So here the prompt is super short. Extract the technical specifications from the text below in a JSON format. You give it one example. So here, for instance, it's random text that you can find on a product datasheet, Google's Nest Wi-Fi and so on. And here this is 
the input and here this is the output that you would like to get in JSON. So typically here you're telling it, okay, you detect the product and you will provide the result like this. You will detect the speed. This is this like this, it will actually interpret and use the large language model below it. And then you can give it a new text. It doesn't have to be Google, Samsung S23. I am already on HG network. It doesn't exist, but it doesn't matter. I have, let's try two kilobytes of RAM, Intel 386 processor. Yeah. Okay. And the color is pink. Okay. So you see here, I'm inventing a new input. This is the text that would be sent to the model. And if I send it, it's been able to tell me the product is a Samsung S23. The network is HG. The RAM is two kilobytes. The processor is Intel 386. The storage and the color is pink. So you see, based on this example, the LLM model is able to provide me with an answer that I can actually use. And this is something that it didn't know about. So once again, in this example, you provide a prompt with an example, and then you provide the new input saying, okay, give me the answer. And here, JSON is super useful because this is how, as a developer, you would be able to parse the results directly without. So I've done some demos and so on based on LLM. And most of the time, yes, I'm using JSON to get the answers and to be able to parse it directly. Let's go on a little bit. Extraction writing. So writing is like the blank page syndrome, right? You want to do something. You want to write a complaint to your landlord, uh, to your administrations, any, anything, and you don't know <laughs> what to start with. And so it's super useful to get you started. Of course, it will not do everything instead of you, but it's an assistant and it lets you start with something. Feel free to try anything. Okay, I didn't try this one so far. Interesting. So I have an email, write a formal email asking Peter whether or not he has received a memo about the financial planning report that I sent last week. If he has not, I can send him another copy of it. So here, typically, I'm giving an instruction to uh, an assistant. And if I do submit, it's going to write a proper formal email. Dear Peter, I hope this email finds you well. And so it gives me a base and I can improve the email. It's super useful. And of course, you're going to find that in Gmail. Maybe you already used it. So you can do a getting started use case. You can do uh, auto-completion of sentences. It's up to your imagination. Let me try maybe something else. Yeah, this one, product announcement. So the marketing team would be super lazy. And so they are asking the LLM model, please do something. Here is the data, write me something up. And so here I have my base about the product that we're going to launch. If you're looking for the best phone on the market, look no further than the, <laughs> okay. And so maybe it's some also to see some of the parameters. So you see, this is typically the answer that I'm getting here. A super useful parameter is the temperature. So how does it work? The temperature is the level of randomness that you will get. So here, for instance, let's imagine I want something very precise and very consistent. If I put the temperature at zero, so between zero and 100, it will always give me the most likely answer. So let me try again. Okay, so you see I'm getting something. If I try again, I will always get the same answer. It's the most likely answer based on the prompt. But if I want to be more creative, like a human being, I'm not always speaking in the same way with the same words and so on. You can increase. And maybe if you go up to 100%, then you will get different answers every time. Sometimes funny ones because it's being more imaginative and sometimes smarter ones. Okay, so the catch line at the end is the same as before. So maybe there's too much information here but I've tried with the, this parameter. There are more, but you need to develop some expertise to, to understand and to play around with it. What else can you do? Ideation. Yes. Getting ideas on what to do. So for instance, on this one, give me an advice. What are some strategies for overcoming writer's block? Okay. So a very open question. 
Okay, and so here you see free write, read, take a break. So you can ask very open questions. And if it's not what you were expecting, then be more specific. What do we have here? So let me try. So here you see I have free write, brainstorm, read, take a break, get feedback, don't give up. The temperature is the maximum. I expect a new answer now, a very different one. There are similarities and some different. But here, typically, with uh, one, yeah, get feedback, take up. Yeah, that's similar. So you can play around with it. You can see, as of today, the different families of problems that you can solve. But again, it started like less than one year ago. So it's super new. Here, for instance, you can ask for grammar correction. The trees is happy today. You can ask to correct your answer. The trees are happy today, <laughs> okay. You say it fixed the verb and the code is always the same, super, super easy. Still in Gen AI, I'd like to show you and maybe you'll try it yourself, something super new. So if you go in Gen AI Studio in Vision, your input is either text or an image. It's super new, so you still need to request access for your company. To generate a picture, maybe you know Midjourney. So this is a Midjourney, but from Google. So you can generate and you can edit images. So I cannot show you here because it's limited access, but the two other features are available. So what you can do is upload the picture. And so you've seen before that you can do a lot on pictures. You can really understand what's in a picture. But here, this is something that was not possible before. So what can I take this picture, for instance? And so I can ask the LLM model, so it's an LVM, a large vision model, with an LLM model, please describe me this picture, but in a precise way. So this is called image captioning. The answer that I get, two cats are playing with each other in the grass. Try with any picture that you have. Of course, the model has never seen your pictures, right? So this is super amazing. I've tried many, many pictures. Let's try another one. So this one, for instance, generate a caption. A pile of wooden Scrabble tiles with the letters O and S on them. So it's able to give me an overview of the picture, but it's more precise than that. It tells me that there's an O and an S on top. I have no idea how to do that. It's super impressive. Okay, uh, maybe another try. I, I will show you something else. Maybe this one. So here I would say a person holding a cat in his arms. A man is holding a gray cat with yellow eyes. Wow. So you see it's super precise. A man, okay. Yeah, it seems like it's a man. Okay, it should say a person maybe now. We're not sure it's a man, but likely a man. He's holding a gray cat with yellow eyes. So honestly, today it looks like magic and you can try that with any picture. Of course, it has not been trained on all the pictures of the world. It's impossible. You can do more than that. And again, it's super impressive. So if you go to visual Q&A, the last tab here, so we did captioning. Now you can do visual Q&A. So let me upload a new picture. So here I have a picture. I didn't ask in anything about captioning, but I can ask what color are the cat's eyes. And here it gives me one answer, the correct answer, blue, just blue. Let's try with other pictures. What sport does it represent? And so here it tells me pool, which is perfect. What numbers can we see? So this is called visual Q&A. You can ask questions on pictures. And here it tells me eight. What color is the ball with an eight on it? Oh, okay. So this is wrong, but a bit right. So. The ball is black, of course, but here it's telling me that the eight is on a white background. So there it's a mistake. It's interesting. What color is the ball? Okay. What colors are the different balls? Ah, okay. I know different pool balls. 
red, yellow. Okay. Yeah, the pool balls are red and yellow. That's correct. Ideally, I would like to have black as well. Let's try to count how many pool balls can we count? Eight. Okay, so this is a mistake. It's incorrect. Yeah, so here typically that's one limit. You need to know that it can make this kind of mistakes. Let's try something else like here. What sport does it represent? Yeah, I would say it's a sport. Yes, it's correct. What can I try here? What is the animal doing? I expect sleeping. Yeah, sleeping. That's perfect. It's something that is super hard. I don't know how they did that on this one. So what are the animals doing? Eating. Yeah, perfect. Okay, let's try here. How many can we count? Five. Is that correct? Yeah, let me check. Because I, I know I tried this, I thought it was a mistake and actually it was correct. Let me try to see the picture in real size. So this is this one. No, oh, okay, one, two, three, four. Now there are four cats. Okay, so here it's mistake. What can we try? Oh yeah, so it's able to detect text. So what brands are visible? Nitaku and T-Bar. I know that T-Bar is a famous brand. Is that correct? Yeah, T-Bar. T-Bar here is detected as a brand. But you see, it's not the only text. So it's super smart. It's able to detect that this is a brand. T-Bar and Nitaku are detected as brands. Uh, let's try another one. What numbers are visible? 40. Yeah, 40 is visible everywhere because this is the diameter of the ball, 40 millimeters. So you see, it's super smart. Let's try something else made in China, made in Japan. I never tried that. Where were the ping pong balls manufactured? Okay, China, it's giving me one. China here. The perfect answer would be China and Japan. But still, I'm super impressed. It's something super difficult to do. One last example, okay. Here, I have no idea what sport does it represent. Water polo, okay. It looks like it. <laughs> and yeah, if you look here, you can guess men's water polo. I find it amazing because it's like the next level in image analysis. As you can see, it's making some mistakes, so you have to be careful. But the image captioning, let's try it on this one, is giving you something super precise. Yellow and black game ball made by Mikasa. Wow. I try, for instance, shoes to tell you shoes made by Nike and so on. Yeah, so typically here it needs to improve, but it's already super useful and it looks like magic. <laughs> and I can't wait to use that in some applications. It's time to try something a bit more difficult, more hands-on. So I'm opening this. Okay, so here it's a notebook that I published on GitHub to use the natural language API. So here, this is the source code. Click on this one or, or click on open in Colab. This is to show you that you can do Python directly in your browser. The only thing that I need is my project ID. So if you go in the Google Cloud Console, you can copy what's after project equal. So it's something like that. It's three words or if you type it yourself, then it's your project ID. So here I am in Colab. Colab is like the Google Drive of Python notebooks. So you can create a notebook, you can share it with anyone, and you can run Python code in your browser directly. And it can interact with your Google Cloud projects. So here I'm in Colab, uh, blah, 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 blah. There's a setup part, so I'm going to run it. Just run it. 
run anyway, okay. So it's gonna install the packages, the client library, so it needs to be updated, so it's been downloaded. The setup is gonna take like maybe one minute. I need to restart because of the new packages, so I just run the cell again. Yeah, so it's running Colab and I have the proper packages. Now here I just have to paste my project ID. So this is the one, maybe the only project that you have, or you can also copy it from project settings. So this is this one, okay? Project ID. So here I set my project ID, it's okay. Now I am in a web page, so I'm gonna authenticate with my Google Cloud project. So I just need to log in. So yeah, I trust this notebook, I made it, so trust me. <laughs> I log in and allow Colab to access my Google Cloud project. I am authenticated. Here I must make sure that my API is enabled. So it's not the first time I'm using it. So it's enabling the natural language model. So the API is called language.googleapis.com. It's always like that. And if you run it again, now it's enabled. You can use it right away. Here I just need some code and then that's it. You can use the natural language API. So the dependency is the following, Google Cloud language. And then the code can be like that. If you'd like to analyze some text, you just need this function. And here, then you can provide any input you'd like. So let me clear everything to see that it runs live. Python is a very readable language and so on. So here I'm doing a text analysis. And in my text here, there are three sentences. And for each sentence, I get a score between minus one and plus one. The first one is super positive, plus 0.8. Python is a very readable language. The second one is even more positive. It's simple, very flexible, easy to learn, suitable, so on. And the last one is in a bit negative. One disadvantage is its speed, it's not as fast. So you see, I can go into the details and I just need this code and it runs in real time. So this is the function to call analyze sentiment. And this is the function to display the table. So of course it's not Google Cloud, I'm using Panda data frames. Entity analysis, likewise, super short function to define. And now you can try to enter any text and call it here. So it's about the creator of Python, Guido Van Rossum. And so here are the entities that I get. Guido is a person, this is the most important entity in the sentence. Of course, we are speaking about the creator of Python. I have a link to his Wikipedia page. It's able to detect that this is about Python, the organization, not about the animal. It's also detecting Monty Python because Python was named after the Monty Python. The location, Netherlands, Harlem. So you can see it's super easy. Let's try something else. So you can try anything. I saw a Python yesterday in Paris. Let's try another city where I was born. So here I'm using similar words. And what do I get? Python, oh, it's something else. So here Python is not uh, an organization. And Orléans is actually a location. Oh, but it's the wrong run. Okay, I know what happened. It's not the one I was expecting. So it's Orleans in Massachusetts. Let me try to type it in French. J'ai vu un Python hier à Orléans. I think it's because I typed in English, it shows. Yes, so, so here it works. So it tells me that, okay, Python is not the language, something else. And here Orléans, so Orleans in English, but in French it's Orléans. It tells me that this is the right city. So as I typed in French, it was able to tell me that most likely this is this city, which is perfect. About syntax analysis, so let's just run the text. So you can be very precise, you can do that, content classification and text moderation. So this is the new one, the latest one. And here you can type any bad words you'd like and see how they are detected Oh, I forgot to add this function. Okay, and now I can run it. Okay, and you can see that the text here, I have to read and I hate it and so on, is really toxic, 68%. And there's an insult. So this is something, what a pile of garbage. 
I hate it and so on. So here it's typically something that maybe you wouldn't say. So yeah, uh, that's about it. You can spend hours, you can spend days <laughs> on these months. You can spend your whole life. It's endless. Uh, we just saw uh, very little of it. I wanted to show you some vision features and so on, but those are tutorials that I wrote. So it's always in the same type of examples. You have pictures, you have, yeah. So you can try them all. But there are lots more and on the Google Code Labs platform, you will find labs on any topic if you'd like to try Android or anything. A good example for this is when TikTok asks back if this is really what you wanted to comment. Yes. Yes. So text moderation is impossible with only humans because if you have an application with millions of users, then you need some automated treatment, the processing. Otherwise, you cannot do anything. So typically it's done on YouTube with automated analysis of videos to detect toxic content and so on. And then when the processing is not sure, when the model is not sure, then you can have a human decide whether it's safe or not, but it can help you uh, detect maybe over 90 to 95% of everything. Any remaining question? How many LLM are available on GCP services? So there are lots. I don't know how many, but what you can see today, at least what you could see is that you have just here four images, you have generate, edit, captioning. So that's at least four, but depending on what you tap on the input, it's more than four. Yeah, the question is a bit hard to answer. So just for LLMs here, it's one big model called Palm. Palm is the LLM model from Google. And now it's even Palm 2. And so for instance, text moderation in the NL API is using Palm. So there are dozens of different models. Most of them are based on Palm 2. Some of them are specialized, like if you'd like to generate a chat conversation, then one is dedicated for that. Another one is called Kodi. If you'd like to generate code, you can try that as well. It's just already endless and it's just the beginning. I think we're gonna be overwhelmed in the next years there'll be infinite solutions just up to your imagination. A big thank you to everyone who was here. I hope it gave you ideas. I hope everyone learned something. My grail is if I gave you ideas, this is why I'm doing this job. So let me know. I'm available uh, on social networks, uh, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, and so on. So feel free to get in touch with me. If tomorrow or next week you have questions you forgot to ask or you find something, feel free to get in touch with me on LinkedIn or Twitter. So thank you everyone for joining us and uh, let me thank you Laran for this insightful presentation and workshop. I think everyone learned something new and useful and uh, I would like to draw your attention to the community, scan the QR code on the slide or click on the link in the chat. And uh, if you would like to rewatch this session and many more, subscribe to the YouTube channel as well. Thank you all for coming. I uh, hope to see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you.